Welcome back, folks. This is the My Black Diabetes Meal Plan podcast, joined once again by uh, Dr. Joel Furman. And uh, folks, today we are having the most dreaded conversation, the conversation I've been dreading for, um, for months, which is the conversation around meat. In the Black community, much like other American communities, meat is a staple component but it is particularly accentuated for us because uh, we were uh, folks who have been, uh, who have made meat, pork, the, the bellies of, of pigs and, and uh, red meat, primary staples. We don't even consider a meal to be a meal without there being uh, some level of pork or red meat. And so uh, Dr. Furman is here help us sort through these ideas and, and really come up with, a, with a, a better way of approaching the dinner plate. And so, Doc, I, I can't thank you enough for, for being here uh, on, on, on today. My pleasure. Look forward to our fun conversations every month. Absolutely. And, and Doc, I get people asking every day for, for us to add more meat to their diets. Now, I don't have a problem with some meat, uh, so we'll add it, and it's a part of their, um, you know, their questionnaire when they're coming in. We're able to kind of gauge where they are, what's their relationship with meat. But what kinds of problems can multiple servings of fish, eggs, and red meat per week uh, cause for, for diabetic weight gain? Well... We should start with the basics, I think. And the basics are that your health is proportional to the micronutrient bang per caloric buck you eat throughout your life. That means we're always, that Americans eat double the calories they should be consuming. Mm -hmm. I always say half of what you eat feeds your needs and the other half feeds the needs of your doctor. That the excess calories you consume obviously, not just make you bigger, but they age you, rev up the speed and create chronic disease and get and have this, these incredible medical tragedies that are across, across all of America. You know. But what I'm saying right now is that I'm saying a piece of chicken or a piece of meat is like a bagel because they're both foods that do not have a significant micronutrient load. They're just empty. They just give us calories with no significant benefit. In other words, we, to be healthy, we have to get good micronutrient bang for every caloric buck we consume. And we eat produce, fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, and seeds. Oh, excuse me one second. Sure, sure. Um, Chris, I'm on a show, I'm on a radio show. Looks like he's got breakfast going. Sorry about that. No issue, no issue, you gotta eat. I'm in somebody's room and they, they didn't know I was gonna show you. Okay. So in any case, what I'm saying right now is that a piece of chicken is like a bagel because they're both sources of calories, but they have no significant micronutrient load. In other words, the bagel gives you carbohydrate, but there's no phytochemicals, antioxidants, we build carbohydrate. The chicken gives you a lot of protein, but there's no antioxidants and phytochemicals, vitamins and minerals. You don't have a huge load of micronutrients. Micronutrients don't contain calories. They're vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, antioxidants, and your lifespan is related to and dependent on your micronutrient bang per caloric buck. That means reducing processed foods, refined carbohydrates and animal products, reducing those high caloric calorically concentrated, low nutrient foods, and getting most of your, your caloric intake from foods that contain a lot of nutrients, mainly vegetables. Vegetables are the most protective lifespan enhancing food and the most favorable high protein, high carbohydrate foods are beans because beans have slowly digestible carbohydrates compared to processed foods. With, and the protein in beans obviously are, don't raise IGF-1 to abnormally high levels. So sugar raises IGF-1, yes, but animal protein, because it's biologically complete, raises IGF-1 more than sugar does. Sugar raises insulin, um, obviously, but animal protein raises insulin too, but not as much as sugar does. So animal protein raises insulin, sugar raises it more. Sugar raises IGF-1, but animal protein raises it more. When we put together 
the high sugar, the, you know, and we talking about here that bread and hamburger buns and pasta and white flour and, you know, any, any kind of high glycemic carbohydrate like bagels and pizza is the same as eating a cube of sugar or a marshmallow. They're candy, they're cake. They go into the bloodstream as sugar. Now, when we eat animal products with that, the, it, the animal products, the animal protein raises IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one. It's called insulin-like because it binds to the insulin receptor. It's a growth promoting hormone that stimulates angiogenesis, the growth of blood, blood vessels to fuel fat growth. And the consumption of animal protein, particularly meat and eggs and dairy, particularly meat, eggs, and dairy, which stimulate fat growth, increase the development of diabetes. Eggs are so powerful that people eat any eggs, even a few eggs a week, double the risk of dying from diabetes if they have diabetes in the next 20 years, and increase, if they're a woman, they increase the risk of developing diabetes. More than, even, even one egg a day increases the risk of developing diabetes in a woman, in a pre-diabetic person by more than 70%. So we're saying here that animal products make it harder for people to lose weight. They're losing weight because their, their fat is marbled. It has fat, their, their protein, their muscles are marbled with fat. And they need to shrink down their fat and also shrink down a little that muscle to get a lot of, to get some of the fat out from the muscle. As we lean down, we get more strength and power per body size. Strength per body size means how many chin-ups can I do? Mm -hmm. you know, how many push-ups can I do? How many, how many squat jumps can I get on the ground, touch my hands to the ground and leap in the air? How many of those can I handle? How much strength do I have, agility, speed, strength do I have per body size? Because the, the largest athletes, like linebackers on football teams who weigh between 250 and 300 pounds, have the shortest lifespan of any occupation in North America. Mm. The shortest of people. Not the, tie, not the quarterback and not the linebackers, people running up and down the sides of the field, but people getting on the line who are bigger and, and um, you know, to, to bigger and they're eating and they're eating more meat and they're eating more calories. They're trying to get large as a beneficial effect of getting bigger and bigger. Power lifters, everyone's a, 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 is associated with size. We want to be a lean athlete. Like you could be lean for to be a basketball player or a tennis player or a soccer player or a, or a biker or a runner, but you're not going to, you know, but, but you're not going to, but we're not looking to get as big as possible. Right. Right. And so, I love you, you actually have a, a very powerful equation that you that you love to use. And I, I believe you can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it's something like health. Right. H health equals uh, nutrients divided by calories. In other words, when nutrients are high uh, and calories are relatively low. That, that is, you were simplifying it the, when you were saying you're getting more caloric, nu a nutritional bang for your cal calorie buck, right? That is a brilliant way to, to really think about this because if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like the issue with the, with a chicken or with a little bit of beef is that yes, they, they have these IGF-1 promoters in them, but really they're just so low in phyto nutrients, phytochemicals, that they're just not worth the cost of, um, they're not worth the cost of entry, right? They, they, they come into our bodies, but they don't really, they don't pay full rent. They give us a little protein, right? They, they give us a, a, you know, a little bit of fat here, but what they're driving in, in cholesterol, in um, sort of these salt additives, um, is is a higher cost than we ought to be willing to pay and the bottom, line, the bottom line is that they accelerate your death they worsen your diabetes they increase your heart attack risk they increase the risk of dementia and cancer they shorten your life and you know what we see we have why should a person accept what i just said mm -hmm. why because i'm saying it you could have another person come on that you could interview and they could say no eating meat is good you know they're actually it lowers when you have eating meat, it's not high in glucose, it'll keep your insulin down. They'll give you the opposite message. Actually, the saturated fats and these things actually distort the insulin receptor and make your actually insulin gets worse. When you're eating more meat and cheese and these high these um high saturated fat animal products, then when you eat a mango or you eat some oatmeal or you eat some, you know, you eat something like a, a piece of sweet potato or squash, the glucose goes higher because the meat distorts the insulin receptors. The saturated fats make it harder to to go to, um, for the insulin to work. 
But what I'm saying right now is the reason they should be understanding and accepting what I'm saying and not another person is because of the credence of the studies that support what I'm saying. That we have short-term studies that look at, that look at soft endpoints, like your cholesterol went down, your glucose went down, you lost some weight. And I could put you on like an all meat diet, like a keto diet. Mm. And it may look better for six months or a year. You may like you lost some weight and your sugar got better. But that generates a hypothesis only. It doesn't generate definitive advice to give people or tell them how to eat from a short-term study where some soft endpoints went down. To give people advice, we have to have long-term studies. Pardon me, I got to We have to have long-term studies gone for decades Right. With many thousands of people looking at the hard end point, the hard end point is death, cancer deaths, heart attacks, cardiovascular deaths, how long they lived. A hard end point means we can, you know, we can put a person on a statin drug and it looks like the cholesterol is dropping in the, in the first six months. But we got to track, you know, 10,000 people for 20 years to see if they maybe died younger of cancer on the statin drug. We didn't know, we don't definitively know that just because lowering the cholesterol, the statin drugs will make them live longer. We got to test it out with a long term study. When we test out keto diets, paleo diets, diets high in animal products compared to diets rich in plant material, we find that in proportion that animal protein goes up, their lifespan and their cardiovascular death goes up, their lifespan goes down and their cardiovascular death goes up. We see definitively all cause mortality, increased mortality from cancer and increased mortality from cardiovascular death and diabetic complications increase with more animal protein and more, more meat in the diet. So we have those long-term studies that corroborate the short-term studies. And we have one long-term studies that corroborates other long-term studies. So I can say with clarity and authority that all the studies testing higher pr animal product diets show that you're actually shortening your lifespan and increasing your risk of premature death. And that carbohydrate restricted diets actually increase the death the most. These keto diets where they take the carbohydrate out, people eat, can't eat any fruit or any oatmeal. Even the wheel study, the Women's Health Eating and Living study, so the people who ate more vegetables had the least amount of cancer, but fruit and vegetables combined showed more protection against cancer than just the vegetables alone did. Mm, wow. When we have more variety in the plant kingdom, the full symphony orchestra playing of G-bombs the greens and the beans and the onions and the mushrooms and the berries and the seeds and the other fruits and the nuts. And we have all these things playing. The more variety of plants you eat, the longer you live, the more you curtail that variety. And of course, the higher amount of animal products and processed foods you eat, the shorter you live. What I'm saying, we have definitive information on keto diets, on animal protein diets. And we see that the more they eat the, their lifespan. Now the question is, do we have studies on people who just eat a little bit of animal products, a little bit of meat? compared to people who eat none, let's say? And the answer is yes, we have those studies too. The Seventh-day Adventist Health Study 2 was such a marked study in the history of nutritional science because among Seventh-day Adventists, and there were thousands of them, like 80,000 in the study, because some of them eat a diet that's, because this religious group advocates no smoking, no drinking, and it tries to advocate people exercise and eat healthy and eat a lot of vegetables and don't eat much meat and things. So among Seventh-day Adventists, you have some that are vegans, some that are flexitarian, some that just eat a little more animal products, some that eat a little bit more moderate amounts and some that are eating more conventionally, but, but you have a whole spectrum, a wide spectrum of different amounts of animal products in the diet. And we can study this group who lives right here in the United States and see who, which, group, which grouping among Seventh-day Adventists living in a similar area, all not smoking and drinking, all who are into health, what affords which people are getting the, the, the most protection. And what we see that as animal protein goes up, more cardiovascular deaths, and as plant protein goes up, more lifespan. That means nuts, mm. beans, greens, quinoa, more plant protein, more lifespan. And the, the ex no nuts and seeds, taking the nuts and seeds and getting fat from oil and meats, shorten lifespan, whereas fat from eating whole nuts and seeds like walnuts and flax seeds and, and almonds, extended lifespan. And that even a little bit of animal products, even one or two servings a week of meat, had an effect to increase the risk significantly of cardiovascular death. Even small amounts of animal products made a difference in increasing higher risk of death. So it seems that the evidence points to the fact that a diet that's totally plant-based, like vegan, is most likely the most lifespan enhancing. 
And if you do utilize animal products in your diet, it definitely should be less than 5% of total calories. Mm, okay. And, and the, reason why, the reason why most of the people that come to my retreat here in San Diego, where they come and stay with me for a few months, the reason why we don't put any animal products in the diet, because when you're a food addict and you've got diabetes and you're overweight, a little bit of these things entice people to want more of them. Mm. And it slows down their results. And we see we get better results and they can stick to the guidelines better if there's no like gray areas. The more you put a gray area, even if it's, oh, it's not going to hurt you to have like one egg white a week or to have one piece of meat a week or a little couple of ounces of chicken on your, or fish on your meal a couple of times a week. And it's not going to hurt you to have a little bit of this or a little bit of that, but a little bit of this comes a little bit of that and a little bit of this, becomes more of that. And as soon as they're eating, soon they're all of a sudden not making any progress. They stop losing weight. They went over the line too far. Right. If I give them a more definitive, you know, make their diet really exactly what they want to replicate. I can generate the two to three pounds of weight loss a week I'm aiming for. I can let them go home, learning the recipes, modif um, being able to duplicate this at home and continue the two to three pounds of weight loss at home until they get to their ideal weight. There's no such thing as an overweight, a person who's overweight that's healthy. And almost everybody we see is sick because they're overweight and they got to be generating that two, at least two pounds a week. I say to a person, you're only a nutritarian if you're slim or you're losing at least two pounds a week on the way to being slim. And that means to be a male, you have to have your BMI below 22 and to be a healthy female, you have to be a my below 21. That means a body fat for a male should be below 15%. And a body fat for a female should be below 22 and a half percent. And if you're not gonna be slim, you're not gonna have an optimal lifespan. Because fat on the body is disease is pro-inflammatory tissue that ages us. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. so I'm pretty um, definitive that and that the that there's a we can go into even more reasons why putting more meat in your diet is bad. Ooh, yeah, I mean, Doc, I've I've I finally found some critics, people who were who are critical of you. I don't need to bring them up here uh, because, frankly. Um, I know kind of why they would be critical and it would be for this reason people are you know they're coming after and saying okay well lean meats are um, you know lean meats are the way to go these are you know very powerful foods in fact the other day I had a, a woman come in let me see she so she contacts us last week and she's asking for legitimate meat options what she's saying is uh, she made it clear that she did not want to be on a bunch of salad and salmon diets um, so I had her send me a list of her favorite foods and her list was full of chicken, of fish, of tuna, and turkey wings. This woman was a person who wanted to get off of um, her insulin medications, of course, but people don't just come to us with type 2 diabetes. They also come, you know, facing obesity. They also come, in this particular case, facing uh, diverticulitis. And, you know, she, so she was presenting sort of a, a, a common challenge, but it was also unique to her. And so the question I have is, what would you recommend for someone like this who has what we call stubborn taste buds, people who are set in their ways, they're rigid with, with the kinds of things that they consider to be food, right? That they consider to be a meal. You got fruit and a salad here, this isn't a meal. Where's the pork? Where's the chicken? Okay, yes, I wanna get off my insulin medication and all my high cholesterol medication, but uh, you've gotta show me, you've gotta at least have, let me have a meal, right? What would you recommend for someone, um, for people like this who do have those stubborn taste buds? What's the first way to kind of get them to, to, to break out of that shell? And, and gosh, no, 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 no. I remember once a patient came to me with her child. She fed the child would only eat chocolate chip cookies and pretzels. He wouldn't eat any food, just chocolate chip cookies and pretzels. And I said, you know what? We have to only give this child fruits and vegetables and take those foods out of the house and the mother came back two days later crying to me. He's going to starve to death. He's going to starve to death. He won't eat anything now. You're going to kill my child. You're going to kill him. I said, no, he's not going to starve to death. He'll survive. If he was shipwrecked on a desert island, he would survive on those foods. And it takes about 15 days of eating those foods to him to like them. And he's going to be crying and being ornery and being mad at you. And But just keep putting the pineapple out and the nuts and the cashew nuts and the... And the um, you know, and the oats with the flax seeds and the berries and do what you keep putting them out there and don't have the other foods, just report back to me two days later. Within day five, five days later, he was eating, starting to eat foods. And by day six or seven or eight or 10, he lost about, he lost a few pounds. He lost about five pounds. He didn't die, 
but he stopped, but he eventually developed his taste for eating healthy foods and became, we, we retrained him to be a healthy eater. It's unfortunate that people have been indoctrinated and trained to eat a diet that's gonna kill them. They have this illicit love affair with these rich, dangerous foods, fried, whatever you said, turkey wings, I don't know what, whatever you said, whatever yes, they're Yes, turkey wings, yeah, yeah sure. she, you know, So your taste buds and your food preferences are trained based on what you ate when you were younger and they can be untrained and you can develop a new taste muscle, but that's not gonna happen overnight. You're not gonna make this person start to like salads and string beans, amandine, and eating hickory nuts, and unless she eats these foods without liking them for a month or so. She has to be willing. Then when they come to see me as a patient, I say to them, do you wanna drop 15 pounds this month or you wanna just lose three or four pounds? Do you wanna get off your diabetic medications and off your blood pressure medications this month? and get totally well, or you wanna flux, you wanna be still walking around with a high risk of death, with a time bomb, a live hand grenade ready to go off at any minute. Now they say, no, 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 I'm here to see you, Dr. Furman, because I wanna do what you want. I wanna get well, I wanna get off my medications. I wanna drop all the 15 pounds this month and 10 pounds the next. I wanna lose 25 pounds in the next two months. I wanna get rid of my diabetes. And I say to them, well, don't decide what you, don't let me hear what you like to eat what you feel like eating, what you think you should eat, what you learned you should eat, what you think is best for you to eat, what you enjoy eating, forget all that stuff. I'm, you just eat what I tell you to eat. I'm gonna write out your meal plan for you and don't evaluate whether you like it or not. Let's assume you're gonna hate it. <laughs> okay. Because you know what? Because it's the because that's the only way you can give my advice a test to see whether I'm telling you is true, that you can really drop 15 pounds this month and get rid of your diabetes if you do exactly what I tell you. Because if you modify this in some way and change it in one way and it doesn't work, then you're not doing what I'm telling you to do, number two. And number two, I'm promising you I'm gonna get you to like these foods and these recipes and you're gonna like this diet, but I'm not promising you to like the diet the first month you eat it. It takes a few months for that to happen. And unless you eat these foods and eat these recipes, you're never gonna like them. If you're going to still put the fried chicken wings and still putting the pork and mixing in the oil and frying your food, and you're not only not going to get better, but you're not even going to learn to like vegetables and beans either. The only chance this person has to try to really make enough change in her diet to get well is by going through the pain of not eating the foods she likes for a month and eating the foods she should be eating. And if she's not willing to do that, I'm, don't waste your time because she's never going to get well. Yes. I've, I've been doing this for 30 years and not everybody gets well. Not everybody's willing to do this. But to spend your energy and your effort and all your time on the people who you can transform and get better. And this person has to be willing to realize that she created the diabetes and the heart disease and the, all these medical problems because of the way she was trained to like those who didn't think she couldn't live without them. And if she really wants to get well, she's gonna have to make a radical change in what she's eating. Oh my gosh, yeah, so-, so You know, so we can dab, we can also, and I, over the years, I've, I've you know, written many books and my book, my latest book is called Eat for, Eat for Life. It's got a lot of great recipes. It's got fan. My, I have like I have thousands of great recipes people can use and that make food taste great. And I even allowed people over the years to use little amounts of animal products as flavoring, like to use a small amount, an ounce or two, into a we're making a chili. You put a little bit of animal, or, or a burger, and you make it. You know, eight ounces of beans and mushroom and, and oats and and all these healthy foods and you, and spinach. And you put a little bit of meat in there to make it taste meaty. You, with the you know you I've you've done all that with a little bit of animal products in the diet. Just add a little bit here and there. But for most people, it works better when they exclude that for a few months even. If they try to do that down the road when they're healthy is one thing. If they're not addicts, it's not gonna have more of that food. But at the beginning, when they're trying to transform their health and trying to transform their taste, it's better they don't even try to do that. It's more my experience over the years is to get these people that are so addicted to these animal, these foods that they think they can't live without. If they're gonna to get to the point we want them to get to, they've gotta start retraining their taste buds and not continuing to go after those flavors that, they, that they're so attracted to. And they've got to start to develop the new sense of flavors to be able to enjoy a bean chili and a mushroom vegetable dish and, a, and, a, and, ra and, and zucchini ravioli and, and just a plain you know, whipped banana with some walnuts and vanilla bean powder for their ice cream and to have um, you know, oats with flax seeds and berries in there. And they've got to start to have a salad with a nut and seed based dressing and taste this stuff. And, when, and develop a taste for it. Because even with a child, it takes 15 times of eating a certain food to have them really learn to like that food. 
your taste buds are trained and we're trying to train these people to flake, to chew the food, chew the raw peppers, chew the roasted peppers, make the mushroom soups, keep eating it every, you know, and that's it's the only way to get this person well. She's not going to get well trying to let her be in control and trying to adjust mm. the diet to her taste preferences. We got to adjust her taste preferences to the diet. Wow. Wow. Okay. That, I mean, a powerful lesson for me today, you know, you, 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 you approach it with this non-negotiable, right? Almost like you, how you're raising, if you're, if you're trying to cha- train a, a new person, a new person who is a, a child for the first time to eat their vegetables, it's not negotiable, right? This is, this is what's on the, on the plate here. Mm-hmm. And to take that same mentality for people who are trying to relearn how to eat is, is something that uh, I'm, I've never considered. I mean, I, I was thinking that, oh my gosh, yeah, people have to have, we have to be able to wean them off of these negative foods. You're saying, no, 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 no. The way we wean them off of negative foods is by presenting them with the right foods and having them stick to that. Only after do we have them, can we reintroduce uh, meat flavorings perhaps into, into, their, into their meal plan? Correct. You can use animal products as a flavoring or as a condiment. That's the most, the condiment. You so, got to get them liking to eat healthy food first. And, and most of these people are so sick they're better off even not going there or talking about it. Just let them do the program. Yeah. They're willing to get well and they've got to get motivated. This takes initiative, motivation, dedication, right? Repetition. It takes anything in life that really has tremendous value and accomplishment. It took some effort and dedication right. to do. You don't just get something for nothing. You have to work for it. They just, these people are just babies wanting their bottles. You know what I mean? They, they're not going to get well. They've got, I know it seems a little bit callous. It really, but the point, it's like a joke I say, you know, I'm talking about food addiction and how a food addict is like crying for their addictive substances all the time. They're going through withdrawal, but it's like, you've got to have, but it's like, you've got to have a person go through some, some discomfort. They've got to be, if they're going to get better, they have to stop their addiction and to get off their addictive substances. It takes some degree of discomfort to get over that hump. Oh my gosh. And, and you've given, you, you actually answered my question, which is what can people do? And it sounds like people can um, really be willing to take the initiative and to just go hate the diet, hate the meal plan for a month, hate it for two months, right? Right. Because those 60 days are going to be critical for the next 600 days, for the next you know 6,000 days, right? We want to make sure. And you may have just saved their life in the 60 days, Mm. you know, they could have had a heart attack in the next month. And, and they just by you being tough on them, you could just save the person's life. This is serious business. That's right. And they're, they're not going to save their own lives. They need somebody to really come with some strength and, 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 and um, authority and convince them and motivate them to take the change, to change, save their lives. You've got to read. It's about re. And I've had people come to my retreats and things where I've had like week getaways, week vacations, and the, maybe the wife comes to hear the lectures, the husband comes to play golf or or to go. He doesn't even want to hear the lectures about eating this healthy. He just wants to go out to you know. He, but he winds up sitting through the lectures, and at the end of the week, he got so much information that upset his, you know, his his idea and thinking that he actually changes his diet too. Mm-hmm. He never thought he would even be willing to eat this way. And he starts tasting some of the recipes. By the end of the week, it's say, say, well, it's not so bad, you know? And it makes a lot of, so you'd be amazed what people can do when they think when they don't have the right information, they don't have enough information, they can make the wrong choices. And they can make, uh, it's harder to make the wrong choices when you have the right information. That's right. I, I can't thank you enough. We are out of time today, Doc. Um, my goodness, folks. You will see Dr. Joel Furman's uh, links. I want you to be able to go to his website. Uh, I want you to be able to, to, to learn more about exactly how he takes people through at his retreat in San Diego um, to a healthier lifestyle in real time. OK, all that's going to be in the description and we will be having another conversation next month. Thank you so much, Dr. Joel Furman. Thank you.